our next speaker. Quien sigue, quien nos va a honrar con una charla, es el profesor José Esteban Galé, que algunos lo llaman Pepe. Yo tuve la suerte, o no, de conocerlo hace 30 años en una estación de tren. Y digamos que así como él tuvo la impresión de qué hace este tipo acá, yo tuve al charlar con él la impresión de que era poco serio. Es más, <risa> al poco tiempo, menos de un mes, yo estaba convencido de que estaba ante un matemático completo, muy culto, en matemática y en, y en otras áreas también, que jugaba bien al fútbol y que en algún sentido nada de lo matemático le es ajeno, como decía el griego, griego, romano. Ni il, ni il humanum a me alienum puto, decía. Eso es latín, ¿no? Pero el humanum lo podemos cambiar por matemáticum, seguramente es válido. Realmente Pepe puede entender e incluso colaborar en trabajos de muchas áreas. Uno mira su currículum y ve cuántas disciplinas domina. La de hoy, la charla de hoy, como ven, ecuación de Poisson, de operadores, mean bounded, acotados en media. Pero podría hablar de geometría diferencial, o podría hablar de espacios homogéneos, o podría hablar de operadores fraccionales en espacios de Benson y demás. De modo que es un, además, personalmente es un amigo y es un amigo entrañable y entonces para mí es un placer seguir hablando hoy, toca, y, y presentar a, a Pepe, Pepe Galé, profesor Galé. Venga y póngase la... Se me oye sí. probando. Bueno, pues muchas gracias por estas inmerecidas palabras, estos inmerecidos, inmerecidísimos elogios. En fin, el profesor Coras, como bien sabe todo el mundo, es un poquito exagerado. Eh, exagerado. Sí, acá se ve bien. Sí. Eh, bueno, esta, a ver, un momento, eh, creo que este es, no sé si es la undécima o la duodécima ocasión en que visito Buenos Aires, donde siempre se me ha recibido muy bien, se me ha tratado muy bien y pues lo he pasado fenomenal. Así que eh, estoy very happy, estoy muy contento de participar en este importante aniversario. Y muchísimas gracias a los organizadores y a sus consejeros públicos. Eh, voy a procurar hacer esto lo más corto posible, así que voy a procurar un poquito rápido. I'm going to speak in English, but since in a certain places I sure I will feel uncomfortable, then possibly I will change to Spanish if necessary. Well, uh, this is. Um, This is work with uh, Luciano Abadías from the University of Zaragoza and Carlos Lizama from the University of uh, Santiago de Chile.
Uh, I'm sorry, but I need to give uh, a list of notions first, a little bit boring notion, list of notions and definitions in order to explain what is in, what is in, in this work, say. So, this is difficult. No, it's okay. Ah, here. Yeah. So for every bounded operators on a Banach space X, we put uh, calligraphic T to denote the powers, the natural powers and the identity of uh, our, our, this operator. And then for non-negative alpha, we define the Cesaro sum of order alpha, uh, this and this um, as the uh, vector value, say vector value uh, convolution of the sequence of powers and the sequence of the so-called Cesaro numbers. Okay. <clears throat> For example, they are in the Sigmund book, very, very famous, uh, which whose definition is here. Okay. And also we call Cesaro mean of order alpha this uh, average. Then uh, we say that T is C alpha bounded if all this average are uniformly bounded in, in north. And so that for alpha equal to zero, we get the notion of power, we cover the, we get the notion of power bounded between that. And for alpha equal to one, we have the idea of Cesaro mean, Cesaro mean bound. Okay. Also for a bounded operator on X, we say that it is C alpha ergodic if there exists a projection indeed or from the Banach space X onto the kernel of the identity minus T, which is given by this definition, the limit of the average, the limit of this expression. And then, uh, so that for alpha equal to one, C1 ergodicity is the classical mean ergodicity given by the existence of such a limit. Of course, C alpha ergodicity implies C alpha bounded. Okay, and the, from the very beginning, uh, there are a number of a number of mean ergodic theorems due to eminent mathematicians like von Neumann, Ries, Takutani, Berlin, and others. In the following, for no, she does Okay, for a pop. Pues para los que estén durmiendo la siesta. Este, está, está bien pensado. Yo soy no, yo todo el mérito es. Sí. Eh, for a power bounded operator and an element, there exists such a limit if and only if the element is in the topological diagram of the kernel and the closure of the range of i minus t. So T is main ergodic, even only if the Banach space can be decomposed into these two uh, <clears throat> spaces as a diagonal sum. Uh, there is the celebrated theorem by Lorch, which says that this is the case for every Bana uh, reflexive Banach space. Well, what about alpha different from zero and different from one? Well, in fact, there is a, quite a number of papers on ergodicity and C alpha bounded operators, Grouse, of Cesar sum, Cesar means, and so on, because there are interesting operators which are not bound, you know, power bounded, but are C alpha bound. For example, I, we have here two examples. In the range of P between one and infinity, you know the Volterra operator is just the integral for elements in LP01. And then put TV equal to the identity minus the Volterra operator. Then some uh, combination of power estimates of TV uh, who goes back to 19, well, due to Hille in 1945 for P equal to one, together with another set of estimates obtained by Alfonso Montes Sanchez and Semanek 60 years later. Uh, so this, uh, I say, from this we can we know that TV is power bounded only in the Hilbertian case. Moreover, Hille in the same paper 
proves that TV is C alpha bounded, which is the same as C alpha gothic in this case, if and only if alpha is greater than one over T. Then uh, another example for beta between zero uh, and one concerns the backward shift on this space, which is given in this way on a Bergman type Bergman space expressed in terms of sequences by means of the finiteness of this uh, condition, which is a norm, uh, well, not exactly a norm. Uh, then as a matter of fact, Ron has that uh, the, power, <coughs> the powers of T are of polynomial growth. And very recently it has been, well, very, you know, well, recently it has been published that the operator is the alpha bounded whenever alpha is stricter than one minus beta over two. Well, in ergodic theory and in probability theory, you know, and very related with Markov chains, we have that this is, we know that there is important to obtain central limit theorems for elements in the range of I minus uh, transi prob transition probabilities. Okay, so it means that it is important for a power bounded operator, for example, to find elements such that the above, the above uh, limit exists. And uh, well, then uh, in this way, we are naturally left to consider um, the, the problem related with an appropriate description of elements in the power of, uh, sorry, in the range of the power to, uh, of I minus T to S or S between zero and one. It is exactly one. A, <clears throat> The question is that in this way, we are left to consider fractional Poisson equation, which is this one. Y is, of course, the given, and X here, for the moment, is the unknown element. OK, the solution to this uh, equation was given, complete sol solution was given by Pierre Nicolin in 2001. Uh, namely, for a power bounded operator, first, uh, we have that X is a solution of the uh, Poisson equation, if and only if this, con uh, this series con is convergent in north. And moreover, in this case, the solution is given by uh, a <clears throat> another series where the coefficients are not the same, but uh, have the same growth uh, behavior as this one. Okay, um, on the other hand, the above characterization in the case of the mean ergodic uh, operator, implies that the, 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 the decay of the, the convergence rate of this element of this uh, arithmetical average, say, is little o of n2 minus s. Whenever we have this condition, which is assumed in all the talk indeed, and uh, is uh, possible to assume without any loss of the general, the closure of the range of i minus t is dense. Well, but, we have also that i minus t to the power s for complex s of real part positive is in fact a holomorphic semigroup of bounded operators, in fact, uh, moreover, a C0 semigroup, whenever, well, under the same condition. Okay, so we denote the logarithm of i minus t, um, well, we use logarithm of i minus t to denote the infinitesimal generator of, of such a semigroup. And the question is, whether or not this minus logarithm coincide, formally you can see the coincidence, coincides with the so-called one-sided ergodic and of course discrete Hilbert transform given by this formula. Uh, well, there are several uh, results, partial results depending on T and X on the operator and the space, but in the end, and the, so the total solution to this problem was given by uh, independently by Cohen, Cuny, and Lin, and also by Hasse and Tomilo with different methods. Uh, we are particularly interested in the approach by Hasse and Tomilo, which um, consists of three ingredients of three steps. First of all, we have a functional calculus. Uh, where here in this uh, mapping, A0D refers to the uh, Wiener algebra, only that the, the notation for the, uh, this is very unusual, but this is, uh, this is useful for us. 
and the functional calculus is given by this uh, formula because of the, the growth of the powers. And please note that Fn, normal F, say, is is, con is used here to denote uh, coefficients, f sub n, f at n, while gothic f is used for analytic functions. Another uh, definition is that one of admissibility in order to extend the above functional calculus given bounded operators to suitable functions so that we obtain unbounded operators in general, but with, with uh, which allows us to, in to to put into this setting the logarithm and one minus c to minus minus f, which certainly don't belong to our uh, binary algebra. And finally, as a third step, we need to study domains of unbounded operators of these uh, operators obtained by the extended functional calculus. Because uh, first, the uh, the study of we can study the range of this in order to we can study the range of this power because this is equivalent to study the domain of the inverse when the unbounded inverse inverse whenever i minus t is injected which on the other hand is always is also assumable is uh, without any loss of uh, generality and also we need to study the domain of the logarithm in order to uh, investigate to find out what happens with this coincidence or equality. And in this uh, classical, well, in the uh, approach by Hasse and Tomilo, the key result is the following. X is in the domain of f of t, if and only if the series where we have the coefficient, the Taylor coefficient of f, gothic f, is convergent. Okay, so now about our work. What are our aims or objectives? Uh, well, uh, we have seen that the previous results are for power boundaries, boundaries, sorry, and involves also main ergodicity. Cases alpha equal to zero or alpha equal to one. But on the other hand, there are a lot of results on boundaries, growth, ergodicity for these kind of operators, the alpha bounded operators, only that there is nothing on Poisson or Hilbert transform, so there is there was a gap. And our aim was to extend the results on these two uh, questions to the setting of the alpha bounded operator. Then uh, follow, we follow uh, the approach by Hasse and Tomilov, and for this we need the follow a functional calculus. I will explain what's that uh, later. On. Well, in a few in a few slides. Uh, here, WF, this is important, is the so-called veil difference. Okay, admissibility, alpha admissibility. Okay, the same, the same as, as before, and I will explain in a few moments. Well, so first, differences, fractional differences. For a sequence, and every natural number, even zero, we define D1, F at N, W equal, equal, are equal in, in this case. W, one f at n, like as this difference, and then using um, induction, we obtain this very well known formula. Okay, so we define the veil difference of f of order alpha, uh, the composition of double u to the n, which is given here, and the compost with double u to minus say beta where W minus beta is given by this convolution product, which is not exactly a convolution product for, from n to infinity. And since I like to invent from time to time some words, as Professor Korach knows, but uh, I would like to call this, for example, con we, call, we could call this uh, contravariant uh, convolution product. Okay. So, According to this expression, we change beta by, or we replace beta with minus beta, and we get the notion of d beta, or d alpha in this case. Okay, sometimes it happens that d alpha and w alpha are the same, but this is not uh, more frequent, not frequent, frequent, and so we have, uh, but this is enough to have this kind of composition, the alpha and w minus alpha is the identity of functions or suitable functions f, and this is enough for our uh, work, for our interest. So, oh, uh, now the functional calculus. 
okay, define the algebra, sorry, the space T alpha as the, sub, the space formed by all sequences in little uh, L1, such that they are subject to this uh, finiteness condition, where W alpha is the veil difference, okay? And K alpha plus one correspond to the uh, Cesaro number. It turns out that W alpha is an isometry from this uh, space onto L, the weight, the weight at the space L1 with respect to the weight K alpha plus one. And we have this equality, but it doesn't matter here. So we put A alpha D, the counterpart of the version of this space before in terms of analytic functions. So all this is formed by all analytic functions who whose style or coefficients belong to the above space. In fact, this space is a Banach algebra for point-wise multiplication under this norm, and we call it uh, alpha binary algebra of um, degree alpha or for sure alpha binary algebra for short. Okay, uh, denoting big delta to minus alpha C like, uh, sorry, as the convolution product of the sequence of powers of C and K, K alpha, we have this representation by this function, sorry, for this function, which is uh, convergent in, in, in norm, in, in modules. And uh, so we have a tool to define um, an appropriate functional calculus. For, alpha, for a C alpha bounded operator in B of X and a function in the alpha binary algebra, we define the functional calculus by means of this expression, which is it says, uh, which gives us a bounded operator because this is converting in norm. And we also need another another concept, so uh, namely the alpha regularization for non-positive alpha. A function, a holomorphic function in the unit this is said to be alpha regularizable with respect to the above operator if uh, there is an element in the binary algebra such that uh, the product point wise product of a and s are also in, is also in the alpha binary algebra and e of t is injective it's a bounded injective operator then we can define h t by means of this formal question which in this uh, gives us a generally unbounded operator but always closed operator uh, this uh, definition was introduced by Hasse, Marcus Hasse, in a number of papers to deal with uh, different or with a different uh, functional calculus depending on on settings. Okay, and now alpha admissibility for alpha non-negative and a holomorphic <laughs> function on D. We say that f is alpha admissible if the sequence of Taylor coefficients is bounded and the sequence of d beta f at n is non negative of every n. And also d, be, d beta, d beta uh, followed by w minus beta is the identity here. And this is, this is required for every beta equal to zero and alpha, not more, it's enough for zero and alpha. And in the second, part we have, we also ask the, the function for being uh, zero free in the unit disk. So that if G denotes the sequence of Taylor coefficients of the inverse, then we ask that function this, that uh, W beta G exists, this sequence, and satisfies for every beta equal to zero, uh, for, well, whenever beta is equal to zero and alpha, this uh, that uh, double beta w beta g at zero is non negative and at n is non positive. Well, for alpha equal to zero, this notion was introduced by Hasse and Tomilov, but in this case, the definition is much simpler. Well, for alpha admissible, we have this uh, representation with the usual uh, convergence. Uh, <laughs> absolute and uniform convergence to compass success and so on. Okay, now, uh, well, in order to obtain our results, we need to construct several uh, in bounded approximate, uh, approximate identities in the algebra, in the alpha binary algebra. And uh, well, um, this work is rather involved, is uh, rather technical and involved, 
takes a number of pages. So I'm I will not give any precise detail, but at least please let me point out that we need to consider uh, formulas of the following types. For example, for for a function f and a function for alpha admissible functions f and h, so that h and the product of f and h are in the Wiener algebra, uh, we have for the very difference of the convolution of this of the correspondence Taylor sequences this formula, which is useful but which is certainly not easy to to handle. And in as a second example, we have um, you can see a kind of well an addition formula for the for the uh, Cesaro numbers uh, and which uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, was was not now, and then uh, we need to produce um, well with this kind of formulas and others we are able to produce uh, bounded approximate identities uh, precisely for an alpha admissible function and every natural number we put g n of c equal to this quantity where uh, the numerator is a polynomial but one over f is also an element of the uh, a alpha because of the conditions of alpha admissibility f, alpha admissible f. So with this uh, function, we are able to prove the following theorem. Well, first of all, uh, let me tell you that because uh, f is an alpha admissible, it, we have that f is positive on the interval zero one. And not, not only positive, that, uh, but growing. So we have a, a a value at one, always a value at uh, at one, infinity or finite, okay? Uh, if f at one is finite, then we have this expression. This is the easier case. The limit of gn is just the identity, the constant in, in norm in the other. If f1 is infinity, the more interesting situation, then we have that this formula, uh, this, sorry, this family of functions is uniformly bounded in norm. And if in addition, we have that one minus this multiplied by f is also in the alpha binary algebra, which means exactly that uh, this function f is regularly stable and it is subject to this condition, technical condition, which will appear in other next slides. We have that the lim we have this limit, which in other words tells us that. Uh, Gn is a bounded approximate identity for the closed ideal in A alpha form by all functions which vanish at one. Okay, so using the functional calculus, of course, we can transfer the above result in terms of operator. Uh, also, assuming that the, the i minus t is injective, which is also what we assume without loss of generality. And then we have exactly the same statement, only that we substitute the variable C by our operator T, C alpha bounded operator T. And with this corollary taken as a lemma and with a number of two or three more lemmas, we, we obtain the following theorem, which is the key theorem in the, in the, in the work. For uh, let L alpha a positive number and let gothic F an alpha admissible function, such that, well, which is also regular, okay, and subject to this technical condition. Then if T is C alpha bounded, uh, such that the closure of the range is uh, of I minus T is X, I assist, this is also can be assumed without loss of generality in, well, in order to study the, the, the Poisson equation and the Hilbert transform, we have that X is in the domain of this unbounded operator, if and only if, the series where you have inverse of differences and um, Cesaro sums converse is convergent in no. And of course, then the action of f of t on x is given exactly by this kind of series. Well, now we need examples to see <coughs> if uh, the theorem is empty or not. And then we, uh, we um, get the how of moments. Okay, let nu be a bounded positive border function 
uh, measure, sorry, on the interval zero one, such that the integral of the measure over one minus t is finite. And let's see M B, the half the moment sequence associated with the measure. That is, we have this integral the integral of exponents with respect to mu. Well, this exponent is a unit more than the exponent of t, but it doesn't matter. Okay. And then we have to obtain the following proposition. Suppose that a and b are non-negative, and given new and the uh, sequence of uh, half the moment sequence letter, as before, put h of zero to the node this sum, h at one of, of one to the node this sum, and uh, h and the rest of uh, moment, sorry. Yes, and the rest of the sequence is the rest of the half moments. Okay, then set also gothic H given by this uh, series, which correspond to this Taylor coefficients and F the quotient of H over one minus, minus C. Then we have that for every alpha non-negative, the sequence the alpha h at zero is given by this integral plus this and this. The sequence at one, sorry, the sequence at one is given by this integral plus this, and the sequence at n is given by this. Okay, and then from here almost automatically we obtain that the um, the function h is in the linear algebra, which means just passing one minus c to the others on the other side, we have that f is uh, regularized. And the sequence the alpha h is non-negative at f0 and non-positive at n. Moreover, as a second part of this set of results, we, we have that for f as has been given, f at zero is equal to this sum, f at n is equal to the integral plus this sum, plus this uh, time. And the alpha f at zero is given by this integral and this and this, and at n is just this integral. And once it almost automatically together, together, one first part and the second part imply that the sequence of Taylor coefficient, well, this sequence is bounded, also uh, formed by a non-negative coefficients. The sequence d alpha f is non formed by non negative coefficients. Uh, we have the composition, which is the identity, and also our technical condition. In other words, this function f is alpha admissible and regularizable. So we have examples of this of these uh, functions. Okay, in principle, are match because they are formed from uh, Hausdorff moment uh, sequences. Well, the proof. The proof is rather long, but this is very simple. Very simple. This is straightforward. Well, everything. Uh, well, everything consists of putting in in series the integrals, right? the sequence. For example, here this blue number is the this blue integral, blue exponent, and blue measure, and so on. Well, this ref is this one by just by definition because these are the coefficients of this. Of this binomial and so on. This is, uh, I insist, quite simple. Here similar, here similar, and here similar. And here I am tempted to stop a little bit in order to relax the talk, saying, I don't know if you would like this, but uh, well, usually I like uh, jokes from time to time. Well, jokes or comments, okay? And I here this is very convenient because 12 years ago, 15 years ago, I would have said here that in order to apply the dominated convergence theorems to, to find our technical condition, we need a kind of estimate like this. Okay, well, my proposition on, on those days would have been that this is a good exercise to put to a students of first year in mathematics. But nowadays, I would say that this is a good exercise to put to a students of fourth year. This is the, the question. Okay, and this is the straightforward proof. No, doesn't matter to, I, I think that it doesn't deserve to, to be uh, inside. But let, um, we should pay attention to the relationship between complete bursting functions and uh, household moments. 
This is interesting. This is very interesting for me. Well, we say that unanalytic functions from the complex plane less the half line formed by negative numbers and also zero is a complete Western function if it can be represented for the positive axis like a semi or, uh, or the positive line by a plus b lambda where a and b are not negative at this interval where mu is a positive and borel mu on zero infinity which satisfies the condition the integrability condition of mu over one plus s then under the change of variable given by t equal to one over one plus s and putting new on t like s over one plus s and the measure mu we has for one has for positive lambda that the above integral can be written in terms of zero one and variable t in this way, which in turn can be decomposed in these two integrals, in these two integrals. So if we put set equal to one minus lambda extended to all the unit disks and gothic h is given by the action of capital H at one minus c, we have this expression, first expression, and then in the second expression, we obtain just the, the our Hausdorff moments. So there is a very uh, closely relationship between these two concepts, complete Bergson function and Hausdorff moments. But moreover, and this is a kind of theorem which is a kind of miracle. In fact, when I was aware of this, I felt impressed. impressed. We have that not the above age, but any any analytic function which is complete and bursting uh, is such a function if and only if the product of the inverse and lambda is also a complete bursting function. I didn't know this very nice result. And then we can apply to this uh, <clears throat> capital H the same argument as before for H and for gothic G defined by this, one obtains the following. G and the alpha G, both sequences are non-negative on uh, at zero and are non-positive at natural n. If we assume furthermore that H of C is different from zero and uh, put F as the inverse of the node by F, the inverse of one over gothic G, which is the same making calculation as the quotient of h over one minus c, we obtain the same properties as before. F is bounded and all these properties, which in other words, uh, we have that F is an alpha admissible regularizable fun function to which the theorem, the key theorem about the domains of F of t for unbounded F t is applicable. So we have a lot of uh, abstract uh, functions. Um, as examples of the above theorem, but we also want to obtain um, concrete factors. And so, namely, it turns out that there are many concrete, complete burst and functions with no zero in the disk one one, which uh, this fact correspond to the condition about H of C. If you remember, H of C was required to be different from zero. This is included, included here. Uh, this is recommendable the following year by Schilling, Song, and Wondracek. Wondracek about Western function. Very nice, very nice book indeed, if you are interested in, in this section. It's a good book. And then for the aims of this talk, we are mainly interested in the two following examples. For r between 0 and 1, we put hr, the power lambda to, to r, and then we have that hr is a complete Western function with respect to this measure given here. Uh, so the function uh, Q, Q, S, Q, sorry, QS um, with Taylor coefficients KS in here can be written by the layer of group in the exponents by as the multiplication of this and this. Okay, so this is a permissible and so on and we can apply the theorem about the domain to the to the well with the objective of the uh, Poisson equation. Also, in the case of the logarithm, we have g equal to lambda minus one over the logarithm, 
which is also a complete Western function with respect to these measures. This is the, the corresponding uh, inverse multiplied by lambda, which corresponds also in turn to this measure. And then we have that H of C, which is in fact minus the logarithm over C, is a, also an alpha admissible function. Okay, you can see that we have here the quotient between the logarithm and C, not the logarithm itself. Why? Because the logarithm itself of one minus C is not alpha admissible. But nevertheless, we can apply this to our case, as we see in a few minutes. Okay, and then um, we can apply the, uh, the above um, key theorem and examples to our equation to uh, Poisson equation. Poisson equation. Now we consider x as given and u is the unknown. And then we have the following theory. For a C alpha bounded operator T such that we have this density, then dense, denseness condition, and for S between zero and one, an element in the Banach space is in the range of the power of I minus T, and even only if this the series conversion, uh, we have once more the, 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 the the Cesaro sum. And in this case, the solution U here, the equation is given by this sum here, gamma and gamma is the, the Euler gamma function, and this is a constant, okay? And moreover, thanks to this, we are able to say that M beta T for every beta bigger than alpha uh, has uh, tends to zero, and we have here different possibilities to, uh, to know what is the delay of this uh, convergence rate. Okay, about the logarithm. For the logarithm, is similar. It's T is as before, and element X in the domain of the logarithm is, um, happens, X is in the logarithm, is in the domain, sorry, if and only if this series is converted. And then we have that minus the logarithm is equal to H T alpha, given by this series plus K alpha, K alpha is this constant, and X. So you can see that minus logarithm is not in this case for alpha difference for C or for one, for one here, is not, uh, sorry, for zero, for alpha equal to zero. In this case, is not the, the Hilbert transform. And since I have explained that I like to put uh, names, invent names, uh, I would like to, that people call, would call this, um, Hilbert transform, discrete Hilbert transform of order alpha. It's not very original. And uh, for the moment, I am not being very successful. Okay, well, in the proof, there is a detail that I would like to comment. Okay, I've said before that the logarithm, is, the logarithm is not alpha admissible, okay? But it can be written decomposed in these two, in this difference, into this difference. Well, the first, uh, the first function is this one, which certainly is in the, not only is admissible and so on. In fact, it belongs to the Wiener algebra A alpha. And the second function is as before. And is as before we have seen in our previous slide. So this is alpha admissible so that we can define uh, this uh, operator by means of the extended functional calculus. And this can be, exactly defined by the functional calculus in itself. So we can define by functional calculus, the logarithm of I minus T. And in this case, the action of the logarithm on X is given by this expression. Well, it doesn't matter now. Uh, okay, uh, but we have, well, I am completely lost. Uh, I don't know what is, I have time, I suppose, sorry. More, more or less means five minutes. Or, Things. Uh, well, uh, the case where alpha is between zero and one is more is more interesting. In this case, we need to change our construction of uh, bounded approximate identities. So we put g n zero given by this product, and we obtain that i minus c multiplied by g n zero is given is exactly this decomposition where s n as you can see is rather complicated it is complicated to handle too but uh, is is an um, is a, 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 a useful tool uh, with this we can obtain the following theorem for s between zero and one and alpha between zero and one minus s we don't know what happens 
from one minus nest to one. Uh, if T is a C alpha bounded, with this condition again, we have that X is in the range of I minus T to DS, even only if this series is convergent in norm. And in this case, the, the, the solution is given by this, exactly this, uh, just as it should be, exactly this expression. And we have also a, a, a convergent rating for the decay to zero of this uh, um, Cesaro mean. Uh, for the logarithm, we have a better uh, satisfactory result. Put as before, our admissible given by these coefficients in the higher corresponding algebra and put gn to on to, to l to the node this uh, well approximate identity. Then in this theorem we have that alpha if alpha is between zero and one for t uh, c alpha bounded operators with typical this condition an element in the Banach space. X it belongs to the domain of the logarithm, even only if the Hilbert convert Hilbert discrete transform converges not, and in any of the other cases, then minus the logarithm is exactly the Hilbert transform. This is an interesting, interesting result. Uh, well, and in the following, in the following slides, we will. Just a few a few words to say that also in this day, Hasse and Tomilo with Gomilko proved that for a power bounded operator, they were able they were also able to give a decay of the well for the decay of this uh, uh, mean, they were able to obtain little o of the logarithm say inverse uh, under this condition. And then the last summer, we have been able to extend this for every alpha, putting alpha plus one instead of n here, and delta minus alpha instead of delta minus zero here. Okay, And this result is not trivial, because we need parts of the above machinery. But uh, this is not uh, complete, completely satisfactory. Uh, the, real, the real result, the good result, um, <clears throat> Here would be the following conjecture in the positive. Suppose that this C alpha bounded operator such that this series converts. Then we would like to prove that the the convergence rate of the <coughs> of the uh, Cesaro mean of all the beta is also little o of one minus the logarithm. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And that's all.